Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, January 5th. Uh, we trust you had a blessed Christmas and beginning of the new year. Uh, we are beginning a new unit for the quarter. This is unit two for the fall quarter, or sorry, winter quarter, which is entitled Dedicating the Temple of God dedicating the temple of God. This is lesson six for the quarter and from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly our lesson title is a long anticipated celebration a long anticipated celebration. Uh, we thank God for uh, blessing us throughout last year and for uh, allowing us to come into uh, a new year and a new decade and we just praise him for all that he's done and I trust that he will continue to bless and meet our needs as he's promised to do. So as we uh, read the lesson today, uh, we can celebrate uh, what God has done for us in our personal lives, what he's doing and for what he's yet promised to do. But our lesson today concerns a celebration of the completion of the temple uh, which Solomon built and God had told David that one of his sons would build a temple that he wanted to build or a house for him. And this is a place for the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence among his people to dwell in. Uh, not God himself, but uh, certainly God uh, did manifest uh, himself, his glory uh, in the temple. Uh, and from time to time, and we'll talk, we'll see... Uh, uh, where that occurs in our lesson text today. But um, the from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our devotional reading was Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 7 to 13. Our background scripture, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. That is a parallel passage which includes a little more detail than the background scripture. Background scripture is also our printed passage, and again, that's 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Uh, the aims of our lesson today from the Adult Quarterly, or number one, understand the significance of Solomon's temple dedication. Number two, intuit how the people of Jerusalem felt as the glory of God filled the temple. And then number three, celebrate God's presence among those who gather in God's name today. The lesson has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is bringing the ark, and that's covered uh, between 1 Kings 8, 1 to 4. The second is placing the ark, and that's covered between uh, chapter 8, verses 5 and 8. And the third is covering the ark, and that's covered between verses 9 and 13. And from the standard commentary, our lesson title is Solomon Summons the Ark. Solomon Summons the Ark, and additional aims or Number one, retell the story of moving the Ark of the Covenant to the new temple in Jerusalem. Number two, explain the significance of the, that placement in historical context. And then number three, propose a way to realize better God's presence in the church's corporate worship or in his or her personal lives. We're going to talk about the fact that we are, in fact, a temple of the Lord, and His Spirit indwells us uh, as we get into our lesson today. Um, the standard commentary outline has two major divisions uh, and then some sub subdivisions, but the two major divisions are number one, the Ark on the Road, 1 Kings 8, 1 to 5, and the second is the Ark at Home, 1 Kings 8, 6 to 13. On the way of uh, background on our lesson, um, 
David has died and Solomon has been established on the throne of Israel. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, verse 12. He's been established greatly, that verse says. And sometime after uh, he assumes the throne, uh, he actually begins to gather the materials that his father has set aside for the building of the temple. Uh, he stockpiled many materials to streamline the process, timber and and vessels and so forth. And so uh, he actually even purchased the property or the land that the temple would be built on. And re you recall from a few lessons ago that was Ornan's threshing floor. And that threshing floor was in the ridge of the hills known as Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah. Uh, we see that in Second Chronicles chapter three, verse one. And if and you real Bible students out there may recall that that was the place where Abraham, in obedience to God's command, would have sacrificed Isaac as a burnt offering had the Lord not intervened and stopped him. So the temple was built on the location where God said to Abraham he would provide himself a ram where Abraham, again, would have sacrificed his son. And so our lesson actually picks up after um, Solomon has completed the temple. Uh, we see um, in 1 Kings 6.38 that he completes the temple. It takes some seven years to complete. And then uh, he summons the elders we'll see in a minute here uh, and the chiefs of the tribes to Jerusalem to celebrate the bringing up of the ark from where it is and placing it in the temple uh, and <clears throat> we'll talk about the uh, the timing <clears throat> most likely timing in between the time of the completion of the temple and the placement of the ark as we get into our lesson text. So let's uh, let's begin uh, by reading the first five verses. We're going to read the first five verses and then we'll have some verse by verse discussion. So <clears throat> verse one reads, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled into him, unto him rather, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Now, the occasion of Solomon uh, summoning the, uh, uh, the men, the chief men, the heads of the tribes, the, uh, the chief uh, administrators, the heads of the, the families to Jerusalem was the uh, festival, uh, feast rather, if you will, of tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Let's read 1a here, verse 1a. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers and of the children of Israel unto King Solomon at Jerusalem. And again, the, uh, the elders uh, is a broad term that refers to the informal heads of the the various Israelite families, and there were the when it says the chiefs uh, and the uh, others 
of the fathers, rather. It's talking about those who are in positions of authority or administration as well. And so they were representing all of Israel. And of course, uh, what they experienced would be shared with uh, their tribes and with their cities. Uh, and so uh, uh, Solomon uh, would basically uh, share uh, this joyous occasion with all of Israel vicariously through them. And uh, so, again, I said the, uh, or part B, let's just read part B, of verse 1. It says that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Now, the there's a lot of confusion, I believe, uh, concerning the use of the name Zion, because it's changed over the years. It changed over the years. It 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 really uh, was a location that uh, was specifically the location of the temple, where the temple was, and later it was uh, referred to as. Jerusalem or the city of David more broadly, uh, but it was a specific location that that really encompassed the temple area as a whole initially, not the entire city of Jerusalem. But again, later it began to be referred to uh, as uh, or used synonymously with Jerusalem. Now, the ark is uh, it's not in the original tabernacle, the one that was carried throughout the wilderness. Uh, it is in a, a tent that David has prepared for it. We remember reading about that a few lessons ago. Uh, and uh, that is where um, it resided for actually some years and during the construction of the temple. So now uh, this bringing it up, is a formal process that, again, Solomon wants the nation to share in. Um, verse 2, And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Now, I started to get ahead of myself a little bit earlier. This feast that they were called to is the Feast of Tabernacle or the Feast of Booths. And it actually um, was to start, to start the 15th day of the seventh month, Ethanim, and last seven days. We can read about that in Leviticus 23, 34. And it commemorated uh, God's provision for the Israelites while they were in the wilderness and they actually lived in tents. So they stayed out uh, in tents during this week as a remembrance of the time when they were in the wilderness for some 40 years before God brought them into Canaan and gave them rest. Um, there is a little um, confusion, I guess, or potential confusion here with the fact that 1 Kings 68 uh, 1 Kings 6, rather, 38, I mentioned that in error earlier, said that the temple is finished in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month. And, of course, that that throws in a little confusion unless you, uh, you, you, you subscribe to what many scholars do. Uh, and, and many scholars believe that uh, it was really the month of bull, the eighth month of the prior year, the, the year prior to when the, the elders and the chief of, of the tribes were assembled. So uh, now I imagine, as you can, probably it took some time to get the news out uh, to the various uh, cities and tribes throughout Israel uh, and to... Uh, to, to for them to coordinate and make preparations to get there. So it's not inconceivable, but it might have taken 11 months for uh, this whole uh, 
celebration or ceremony and so forth to be orchestrated and planned for uh, that that is a the better interpretation than I think the other one and that is that the Feast of Tabernacles was extended uh, into the the next month that I don't be believe that because it was to be a seven day celebration not a not a 14 or longer day celebration um, now the uh, so the men come again it's the seventh month great preparations have been made no doubt uh, I would imagine uh, the men have brought gifts uh, and sacrifices to make and perhaps that took some time to orchestrate as well verse 3 and all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark now the elders are assembled there at Jerusalem and they're actually witnessing this procession of bringing the ark from uh, the place where David had uh, had set it and it uh, it was done, of course, in strict accordance to to David's uh, instructions following the uh, the mishap at uh, that that resulted in the, the death of Uzziah. And we can read about that in uh, First Chronicles uh, chapter 15. Uh, actually, we can back up to First Chronicles chapter 13. We read about the the mishap when Uzziah, who was apparently not a Levite, actually reached out and touched the ark to steady it because it was on a cart uh, and uh, and died. Uh, David had the priests and more specifically the Levites, I should say, the Kohathites, which is a branch of the priestly tribe of the Levites that had the exclusive responsibility for transporting the holy articles, including the Ark of the Covenant. We can read about that in Numbers chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. So the Kohathites, uh, which were Levite priests, uh, or of the priestly tribe at least of the Levites, had the responsibility for transporting the Ark, and they are uh, bringing the Ark up from where it is in Zion, the specific location which again was uh, Ornan's threshing floor to the temple at Mount Moriah that uh, Solomon has prepared for it and really don't know the distance between those locations and they brought up the ark this is verse 4 and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. So they're bringing this up. They're carrying it on poles. They're not, it's not on a cart. But they also bring up the tabernacle. Remember, the tabernacle was a huge tent. It had compartments. Uh, it had outer court, had, I mean, had holy of holy, had a holy place rather than a holy of holy that was within a veil inside the tabernacle. And they just uh, bundle all this up and bring it up to the temple area. Uh, there's nothing said about what was done with the tabernacle. It perhaps was stored someplace for for memorial's sake. I'm not really sure. Uh, but they also brought up the vessels. There were vessels of uh, gold. There were instruments that were used in the sacrifice and so forth. But David had all had made new vessels and sol and sol or had provided rather silver and gold, I should say, that Solomon used to make all new vessels as well. We'll see that in a in a few minutes here. Uh, so verse five reads. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel were assembled unto him. Now, of course, it means all the elders and the chief of the tribes, uh, not everyone in Israel. They were representative of all the tribes of Israel. Were assembled unto him and with uh, him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Now the the sacrificing was uh, their worship. I mean that was their form of worshiping God. 
uh, extolling him. And, uh, of course, there were sacrifices for Thanksgiving, sacrifices perhaps for, uh, I don't know if this was a, an occasion where sacrifices were made for sin, sin offering, and so forth, but uh, there, no doubt many of the, or not all of them, the elders and the chiefs brought sacrifices we know that Solomon added his own to those that were brought, but they are sacrificing a, a, a large number of animals. And we can actually see, if we skip down uh, to verses 62 and 63 of chapter 8, uh, we read, and, king, and the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offering, uh, which he offered unto the Lord, two and twenty thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So they're doing this as part of a, a dedication of the house. The house, uh, of course, was uh, beautifully uh, ornate. Uh, it was uh, one of the, uh, it was probably the, the most beautiful uh, building in the ancient world, but it was nothing until the ark was brought into it, symbolizing the presence of the Lord. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, a little more about that um, in a minute. So let's read uh, verses 6 through 13 now. And the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his, unto his place in the oracle of the house to the most holy place even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark and the cherubim covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves that the ends of the stave were seen out of the holy place before the oracle. And they were not seen without. And they were, I'm sorry, and, they, and there they are unto this day. Verse 9. There was nothing in the ark save the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Verse 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, and I have surely built thee an house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And that happens to be our key verse, that last verse, verse 13, I have surely built thee an house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. So verse 16, and the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place and to the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. Now, let's, let's remember the, the temple was basically fashioned after the design of the tabernacle with a holy place, with an outer court, holy place, and then a holy of holy place within the holy place that was separated from the holy place by a veil, which uh, was, was some 40 feet or so high. Uh, and that is where the ark was placed in this holy place, which, was which had access restricted. Uh, the high priest only was to go in once a year and with blood to sprinkle on the mercy seat to make an atonement 
for the nation, for the children of Israel. Uh, and uh, it, it talks about sitting it, and it, of course it had um, wing, it had uh, cherubim, which was a form of angel with wings outstretching toward one another on either side of where the ark was placed. And they were, these were tall structures that actually uh, were uh, covering the rafters of the, of the roof, if you will, of the temple. And the wings, again, were touching one another, directed toward one another. And the faces, which were the face of men, uh, were facing one another toward the ark, but also in a manner that looked outward uh, toward the priest that was ministering before the ark. And uh, the, the cherubim, if you read uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, you really get um, maybe an understanding of what they perhaps look like, uh, but uh, and it's it's really difficult to describe how they looked otherwise. In some cases, uh, some believe they had the body of a lion, the face of a man, and then the wings of a bird. Uh, but in any case, we know that these are uh, statues are symbolic of of angels that are figuratively guarding the ark. Okay, and of course there were cherubs on the the seat of the ark, the very lid, if you will. It had a very ornate lid. It was gold. Uh, the whole chest was overlaid with gold, and the they had wings that were facing each other as well, or directed toward one another. And uh, of course uh, the seat, basically uh, of the uh, the lid, rather symbolized the seat, the mercy seat where the Lord uh, uh, presence was and he said he would actually instruct he would speak from there and he would actually instruct the nation of Israel from that mercy seat now the word oracle that's used really means the the innermost uh, area of the house okay that's that's what oracle means the innermost chamber of the temple verse 7 for the cherubs spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim, cherubim meaning the plural of cherub, uh, covered the ark and the staves thereof. So they stretched forth their wings over the ark, and they actually again covered the the staves of the the building structure, the roof structure. This is not the staves that were actually in. Uh, used to transport the ark itself, which were long poles. And it, it was not uncommon for um, people, cultures in the, uh, in the Near East, uh, ancient Near East, to, uh, if this is found in artwork, to have cherubim or celestial beings guarding sacred places. Um, in fact, the first place we read about that is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, uh, where God had placed a uh, cherub with a flaming sword in the Garden of Eden. Verse 24 of Genesis chapter 3 reads, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life to guard the tree of life, which was a sacred, a sacred tree. So, again, it was not uncommon for uh, symbols of these celestial beings, these angels, these cherubs, to to be uh, used to guard sacred places. Verse eight, and they drove. I'm sorry, and they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen in the holy place before the oracle and they were not seen without and there they are unto this day now what 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 is happening here is that uh, the Korathites Cor that after they place the uh, the ark uh, in its position within the holy place they actually pull the poles back uh, and they actually were used to serve as a guide 
uh, for the priest when he entered the holy place, uh, uh, but they protruded, it appears, beyond the veil, but not beyond the holy place, and they were just left there, and uh, the, the, the writer says, unto this day, unto this day, which which really suggests that this was before, obviously before uh, the Babylonian captivity and the temple's destruction in 586 B.C. Verse 9. There was nothing in the ark save or except the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now, um, those of you who, again, have studied the Old Testament know that uh, originally there were other things in the Ark of the Covenant, the tablet, of course, that God had engraved the Ten Commandments. This is not the original set of tablets which God cut out of the mountainside which Moses broke when he came down and he saw the uh, the children of Israel in rebellion and in drunken idolatry. Uh, but God had Moses carve another set of tablets and bring them up to the mount, and he actually engraved the Ten Commandments again on those tablets. They were placed in the ark, representing, again, the law and God's covenant agreement with the children of Israel, he would bless them, uh, and 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 then their seed after them, uh, as long as they kept his law with the land in the land. If they didn't, then he would spew them out, as he did the Canaanites before. And he, we saw that he took the Assyrian, the northern captivity, the northern kingdom into captivity by the Assyrians initially, and they were scattered, and then eventually the southern kingdom or Judah into Babylonian captivity. But again, originally there were uh, there were more items in the the the, the chest. The, the ark was a chest. Again, the lid could be removed. There was a t the tablets or tables of stone with the engraved law, ten commandments in them. There was the a jar of manna, uh, which again. Uh, was to remind the children of Israel how God fed them, how he provided for them in the wilderness uh, for some 40 years. And then there was the rod of Aaron that budded. This was a dead stick, really, that God caused to bud, uh, and again symbolizing his miraculous power and provision for the children of Israel. And how he could bring life out of something that was dead even. Now it says um, that Moses placed the ark or the tablets in the the ark at, at Horeb. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. So, so Ornan is affording David the respect and honor of a king. He's recognizing him again as, as his king and bowing himself. Um, and he is, again, he and his sons had been threshing. Uh, the angel appeared to them uh, or was in sight, frightened the boys, and on and his air, uh, <clears throat> perhaps by himself, um, bowing to the king. Verse 22a, then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. And I may have mentioned our parallel passage came from 1 Samuel. Actually, our parallel passage, passages came from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 2 Samuel chapter 24. So David uh, uh, basically tells Ornan to grant him the place. Uh, where he is, uh, that he might build an altar. Now, God has commanded him through his seer, Gad, to build an altar. And the purpose of an altar, uh, of course, is to make a sacrifice. And the, sac the purpose of the sacrifice is to acknowledge uh, sin, some sin, 
and of course petition God's forgiveness, uh, his forgiveness for the sin. So David has repented. He's he's already said he's acted foolishly, or uh, he will declare that that he's acted foolishly, and he asked God to forgive him. And we we saw earlier or read earlier how he wants God to just punish him and his father's house, and not to continue to punish the nation for his sinful act. Um, part B of twenty two says, "Thou shalt grant it to me." for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people now you know i don't know that uh gad mentioned that the plague was going to be lifted if he built this altar and made a sacrifice maybe david is just trusting that god is going to do that uh but he he is not wanting any discounted price for the place uh, he's wanting the entire area, as we'll find out uh, a little later, uh, not just the immediate threshing floor. And, uh, of course, uh, we skipped over some verses where, no, nope, no, nope, we didn't. It's the next verse. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the king could have simply commanded that the land be turned over to him. Uh, we call that eminent domain these days where <laughs> where the government just takes over your property for the good of the for the greater good of the area or the uh, the public uh, verse 23 says and Arnon said unto David take it to thee and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes lo I give thee the oxen also for burnt offering and the excuse me threshing instruments for wood and wheat for the meat offerings I give it all so Ornan was willing to give everything that David needed to build the altar and the wood and uh, the, the, to build a fire on the altar and and the, the sacrifice of uh, both the animal the oxen and the food or meat offering uh, and uh, uh, which you know was very generous. I mean, very generous of, again, a man that uh, was a Jebusite uh, of the people group that the Israelites were commanded to destroy when they came in. So it really shows uh, some extraordinary character on his part. But uh, in verse 24, David says, And the king, and king David said to Arnon, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. And David refuses the offer. Uh, he is uh, a, a, a very, uh, he, he's basically uh, reminding us of a very important principle. And that is, uh, we are to give to the Lord uh, sacrificially, or we are to give something that costs us. That's what gives it meaning uh, to the Lord, something that costs us if we give him. And in this case, um, they were sacrificing animals and, and food offerings. But if we were to give him money that was given to us, uh, for example, we were to give that as a tithe it would not be it would be meaningless to god because it meant it, it cost us nothing and it was not uh out of our what he had provided for us in the in our normal course of life uh, in terms of his provision he wants us to return a portion of what he blesses us with so that's a it's a it's a, it's a great principle that uh, david is reminding us of here Verse 25 says, So David gave Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. 600 shekels of gold by weight. Now, you serious Bible students out there uh, that read the parallel passage in 2 Samuel chapter 24 noted a pretty big discrepancy. In that passage, Ornan is called Ornan, or I spelled differently, but I guess it's pronounced the same. Uh, and it looks like there, 
that David pays is I said it said so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. Fifty shekels of silver. Well that that's a big difference. Uh fifty shekels of silver uh that's quite a bit less than the six hundred shekels of gold. So how do we explain that? Well, the explanation really is found in the first few verses of uh, chapter 22 of Second Chronicles. It looks like uh, David bought the entire area, not just the threshing floor. He may have paid just the 50 shekels of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen, but he bought the entire area because verse 1 of chapter 22 tells us, uh, Then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offerings for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he sent masons to hew wrought stone and to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, and it talks about him uh, cutting down uh, cedars and so forth. So he jo he purchased that whole area with the 600 shekels of gold to to actually harvest the materials needed uh, for the temple that Solomon would build. At least that that seems to be uh, uh, one interpretation. Now verse 26 a and David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. So David uh, does as Gad, uh, God commanded him through Gad. He built the offer, the altar rather, and he offered a burnt offering and peace offering for sin. This is to, to make peace or restore peace with God for sins that he had committed. This is a personal offering. It's not for the people. It's for him. It's an offering uh, for his sin. And then um, verse 26b says, And he answered him from heaven by fire, the altar upon the altar of burnt offering. So God demonstrated his acceptance of the offer by sending fire from heaven to consume it. Uh, we see where God did that uh, in Second Chronicles seven one, uh, when uh, when the Lord is pleased with the dedication of the temple, uh, and we see uh, that uh, at Mount Carmel when after Elijah prays at Mount Carmel, First Kings uh, chapter eighteen verses thirty six to thirty eight. Or how God sends fire to consume the offering, and that demonstrates His acceptance of the offering, and is, and is, is, is He's pleased with the offering. And then finally, verse 27, and the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. So God had had stopped the. Uh, the plague that uh, he gave uh, David um, the choice of choosing uh, God or David rather uh, threw himself uh, in the, the hands the mercy before the mercy of the Lord rather than be turned over to enemies for for X number of months three months I believe or a, a play uh, a famine for seven years uh, and God, of course, did. Uh, he didn't repent when the word repent was used. It means that God just stopped. Uh, he obviously knew uh, what, how much suffering he was going to inflict or allow. Uh, but uh, he wanted David to truly repent of his sin. And of course, David was influenced by <clears throat> by pride. Uh, that Satan actually induced him or tempted him to uh, to uh, indulge in, and and we want to be careful because um, you know the, the proverbs tell us, "Let he that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall." Or that actually, uh, Jesus said that 
And we are to always be on guard, especially at those times when we are experience some victories or some high points in life because uh, we become vulnerable then sometimes we can uh, perhaps and I certainly hope we don't uh, take some personal pride and think that uh, we are experiencing whatever high uh, or victory because of our own strength and not give God the glory Uh, God wants us to give him the glory in everything every good thing now the foolish and uh, and, and sinful things that we do, certainly we're to take full credit for those, we're to repent of them, and we're to forsake them. But anything good that we do, say, or think, we need to give God praise for. So I hope that we have learned uh, a little more about these passages today, uh, covered by our two, our two lessons. And may God bless you, and may God keep you, is our prayer. <laughs>